All right, we are live. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to Crowdcast, uh, Techstars Crowdcast here. Uh, my name is Casey. I'll be helping to moderate the event today. A little bit of housekeeping before we jump in. If you are tuning in, go ahead and shout out where you're tuning in from in the chat box. I'm tuning in from Denver, Colorado. We have our speaker, Brian, here from Atlanta. Um, also, if you have an, a question for our speaker, go ahead and submit that um, down below in the ask a question box. We'll try to get to as many questions as we can. Uh, and if you are tuning in from LinkedIn Live, hello to our followers over there. Um, so today we are going to be discussing how to keep your startup on track in the midst of COVID-19 and other challenges. So I think this is a great topic for a lot of the entrepreneurs out there, a lot of the business owners, um, as we are you know, seeming to go through even more of this lately. Uh, and so today we have um, our global network partner, Bennett Thrasher, with us, Brian Hamm, partner at Bennett Thrasher. And Brian, I'd love for you to introduce yourself to the audience. Yeah, thanks. I'm glad to be here. Glad to be uh, speaking to Techstars and whatnot. Really enjoyed the uh, relationship over the past uh, year or so. Um, so I'm Brian Hamm. I'm an audit partner at Bennett Thrasher um, and co-lead our technology segment for you know the past five years. Very involved with startups from early stage to 150 million in revenue. So we kind of uh, hit the wide spectrum there. And as well as I deal with a lot of investment funds and, and whatnot that and turn around and invest in the technology companies. So. Great. All right. So I have some questions uh, ready for Brian uh, about a bunch of different topics we'd want to hit. So I'm going to kind of go through those. And like I said, um, submit any questions below our faces in the ask a question box and we'll get to those. This is your opportunity to get advice straight from the source about running yeah. your, your company. Um, all right, Brian. So we went through the first wave of COVID and it seems that many places, um, especially here in the U.S., are approaching a second wave. Uh, what can businesses do to prepare for this oncoming second wave? Yeah, I think there's uh, that's a great question. Um, if anyone knows 100 percent and has a crystal ball, that's great. Uh, I think the, the things you can do and should think about are number one. Um, how can we make sure our employees are able to be fully productive at home and stay active um, throughout this period um, of, you know, working from home and whatnot? We don't know how long this is going to be. So I think that's one thing to do is make sure that, you know, your systems are set up to do that. Now, the second thing is also look at your company and find out and think about it and critically think at, about it as um, what are our strengths and what are our weaknesses? What are we fearful of in the future? Are we fearing that our, our customer base is going to go away? Are we um, fearful they're not going to pay? Yes, we might have a huge customer base, but if we're not getting paid, it doesn't, doesn't help us any. So I think understanding where you're vulnerable is a good thing to start thinking about now. Um, and lastly, I would always say cash is king. So especially as a startup, you need cash every day. Um, you're constantly looking at fundraising and whatnot. Cash is king. So where you can save, uh, look for those areas. See if you can tighten your belt up and save in certain areas. Awesome. And so I guess, you know, speaking of that, what are some general financial best practices that businesses can take in times like this? I mean, I, and I think one of the best things is reaching out to your customers, um, making sure, number one, they're happy. Number two, they're enjoying your product and it's a must have instead of a nice to have because um, those things, especially, you know, technology, I think it's going to be very um, important during this time as we're all we're all on this this um, crowdcast here and we're using other sort of medias to communicate and get work done. So making sure that your technology is a must have and um, understanding what your customer is going through because uh, you might have to adjust it a little bit, pivot a little bit and just understanding that um, if all your customers, like for instance, if all your customers are restaurants, it's probably a struggle for them right now and finding out how to keep them while also keeping yourself afloat is key. And speaking of customers, we've had people ask this before on AMAs and Crowdcast, how can you work with customers during times like this if payments are affecting everyone, right? You want your payments from your customers, but you also understand that it's affecting them. It kind of has this like chain and ladder effect. So um, how can companies work with customers if they also are having issues? That's a great question. Um, 
I think number one, understand, I mean, going back to where are you spending cash? Um, if cash is, is a struggle right now for you collecting from customers, where are you spending it? Where can you save? And then, you know, finding out, is there a new revenue stream you can go into? Um, is there a new sort of, um, I, I wouldn't call it a pivot because I don't want, I think if you are, have a substantial customer base, I don't think you need to pivot away from that just because it's, it may be going through a downturn, but I think adding other customer bases and spreading yourself out where you don't have these concentrations are going to be very key during this time. Mm -hmm. Um, all right. So let me see. You mentioned kind of financial plans and, you know, looking at your financial best practices, but what parts of a business plan should we reevaluate during this? You kind of mentioned, you know, pivoting, whatnot, but what are some key parts of a business plan that a startup or a company should really look at? Um, I mean, look at your long-term arrangements. I mean, I keep going back to cash is king, but I think that is just so pivotal. I think right now, um, I've got a lot of companies that are reaching out to their landlords to find out, Hey, can we get deferred payment streams or can we extend and get some relief on that, on that cash flow? Um, some other things are, should, should we look at consultants as, as opposed to employees? I know, I know that's a, no one wants to let anybody go, especially during this time. But if you can get more out of consultants with limited expense, it's another thing to think about. Um, and I just going back to building your customer base and looking at all your revenue streams. Those are, I, I keep reiterating, but it's, it's just so important. I think right now. Mm -hmm. Have you heard of any companies? I know you mentioned, you know, industries that are kind of getting um, hurt or hit. Have you heard of anyone kind of doing pivots? If a company's looking to really pivot right now, is that a good idea or should they, you know, wait a little bit longer? Um, I would, I would caution them to um, not just, you know, to make sure you're getting all the intel from the environment. I mean, this situation is unprecedented. Um, I don't know uh, of another time we can really compare to. Now, if, if this pivot or additional thing, you know, gets you into another revenue stream that makes you, you know, more uh, solid and continuing to grow in the future. Yes. I always would think that, um, but I would also, you know, make sure you you don't abandon what you've been doing that you've been so good at, but just ensure that you continue pressing forward. Yeah. Great. Um, so before I keep going with my questions, I see we have a couple mm -hmm. from the audience. So we'll go ahead and get to those. And just a reminder to go ahead and submit any here for Brian um, about managing your startup in the midst of COVID-19 and other kind of business and financial challenges. And if you are on LinkedIn, I'm also monitoring that feed. So go ahead and you can submit questions in the chat area there too. Um, so this first one, can you share more about the benefits of scalable accounting and finance outsourcing? There, there's a lot of benefit to that. I think um, a lot, probably, I want to say 60% of our technology companies, which are in the you know early stage to kind of venture pre-venture, pre-growth stage are outsourcing their, um, their accounting and, and doing that very well. Um, I think you can get a lot of experience with using outsource tech um, accounting without having to bring them in-house. So let's say if you had a CFO in-house, let's just, just making up round numbers, it's $200,000 a year just to have him, him or her all year. But you could get into a situation where it's an outsource where you're spending hourly and maybe it's it's down to fifty to seventy thousand dollars a year because you're only using them periodically throughout the year and your books and records are there. I I always encourage early early um, early stage and startups to look to outsource because you're you're so focused on growing your business, getting the product working right, coding that you know accounting is not necessarily something you 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 need to you know take the brain damage over you know outsource that get someone else to help you um that can either be an accounting firm that you know is uh has a big technology uh sector like we do um or it could be just and or it could be a group that just does technology outsourcing so they're only doing cfo and accounting work and then they have the relationships with accounting firms that can get you um all the services you need and I think, you know, 
those people know about the industry and keep up so much more closely than someone who's running a business and thinking about how to grow a customer base, how to get my product out there. So there are opportunities out there, whether it's R and D credits or other things that you can take advantage of now to keep your cash flow coming in that they know all the time without you having to spend time keeping up with it. Great. And so a little bit further on that, um, for any of the entrepreneurs that, you know, maybe listening and thinking about hiring, um, or outsourcing, you know, for finance and accounting, what are some best practices when you're kind of starting on that journey, right? Your company is growing and you're like, Oh crap, we need to hire someone to really help with this. So like, what are some best practices of finding, you know, the best people to work with for that? And I, I think this is, um, this is with any employee or consultant is finding out who best fits you. Um, there are a number of, um, you know, tech fractional CFOs and whatnot out there that can um, have expertise in certain industries, you know, whether it's health tech or FinTech or um, SaaS solutions or anything and finding that right solution, because remember they have a network that they're establishing and keeping throughout that could, could really benefit you. So I think understanding how they benefit you and you benefit them is kind of the key and understanding what what they do and what their background has been. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, another question, what are some of the biggest challenges you're seeing right now that startups are facing outside of COVID? Um, I mean, I think it's it's kind of the, the normal. I mean, um, I think looking for funds from investors you know, setting up, you know, establishing good, um, you know, uh, products uh, from the startup, uh, understanding your customer base and what your your target customer looks like. I think all those things are always going on and something always to learn how to, to refine and, and whatnot. And there, I know in Atlanta and I'm sure in other programs there is, or other cities, there are programs that help you do that and help you navigate and understand where, um, where your blind spots are and whatnot. Great. Um, next one coming in from Dan, what is the best way to find someone that can connect you with potential post seed investors? Um, I think, I mean, your network should be able to help you. Like for instance, uh, we work with a lot of investors, whether it's through um, different organizations that we're involved with or whether it's relationships we have, um, you know, and your lawyers can, your bankers can, we're all kind of working together in the ecosystem. So that's one way. Another way is, I mean, you know, going to your local, um, you know, sort of tech event or tech startup area where those, those investors are there and they're looking to meet you as well. So, um, and some of them even have applications online. If you do a little Googling and, and trying to identify who they are, you can, uh, I was talking with one earlier today, they're, they answer every application that they're emailed, um, whether it's a, you know, a startup or whether it's growth stage, they're always going to talk to them and, and, um, and, you know, try to find out more about them and see if it's a fit. Now I would say when looking for investors, look for someone who's going to help you. Don't just look for the biggest paycheck. Um, you know, a lot, just like with the fractional CFO and the network and whatnot out there, you know, those investors also have a network. Now, if they specialize in, again, health tech, fintech, any of that, and that's what your product is, they're going to bring some stuff to the table to help you grow and whatnot. They're, they're there to help you grow. So they want you to grow and be successful. And, you know, speaking of being kind of these COVID times, a lot of people are working from home and there's not a lot of traveling. Have you seen a benefit of being able to connect with more investors because everyone's online and not super regional? Yes. Um, yeah, I would agree. You know, the Zoom meetings and, you know, Crowdcast or whatever sort of medium you're using is that really open the door. I have met with potential clients in California that in the past we might have had to fly out there, spend, you know, four hours on a plane or whatnot. And, and you know, we had a, a recent event here in Atlanta, which is our big uh, venture event. And we opened it up it's to uh, it's a, it was pretty much all virtual and we had record number of investors and you in the past they would fly down to Atlanta for two three days and then maybe bring one two people from their team but now they're expanding it and saying hey I can get you know five to ten people in there looking at these different companies and talking with them so I think it's it's adding to it and allowing for more opportunity 
Great. All right. Um, we have a couple questions in there. I'm going to go to my list that we've had before on these. Um, speaking of investing um, and fundraising, if COVID-19 is stopping our growth, uh, should we keep fundraising or wait? What's your perspective? Um, that's, a, that's a great question. I mean, I think every investor likes to see the, the sort of hockey stick, the growth keep coming. Um, but I also think they understand the times. And I think under having a good story and telling your story and letting them know that you, you understand where you're going and whatnot is, is the key to that. You know, yes, we're, we're slowing down because of X and, but we're coming out of it because we're doing X, Y, and Z. And then something else to think about is, um, oh, I just lost my train of thought. Um, yeah. Um, It'll come back to me. I apologize. <laughs> well, the next question is about fundraising also. Um, okay. And, um, you know, we were just talking about whether, you know, whether you should stop fundraising or keep going. Mm -hmm. um, you know, speaking of that, do you have any advice on keeping investors updated? Um, you know, are investors wanting more updates than usual in times like this? Are, you know, should you be sending updates more regularly because things are changing? Or what are your thoughts on investor communication? I, I always lean on communicating more. Um, you know, if people are communicating and whatnot, um, I think that helps. Whether the investor is worried about you or not, I mean, some some companies I've seen that are growing leaps and bounds right now, and the investors are getting exciting, but they're staying out of their way, so they don't need the constant communication, and they're focusing on the ones that are struggling or or not growing as fast. Um, so I think communicating and doing that, and you know, these investors, like I said earlier, they have a lot of experience. They know the market, know how things are going and can identify stuff that maybe the company and, you know, the leaders of the company aren't necessarily thinking about because they're ingrained with doing the day-to-day -day operations and constantly trying to grow market share and revenue. But they, there might be a sort of a, um, not necessarily a pivot, but uh, another stream that can go down that could add some value. Um, but I did remember what I was going to say is working with the conference that I'm on the selection committee with. And when we're trying to get these companies to present and whatnot, and a lot, we always hear, well, we're not fundraising right now. We're not fundraising right now. We always say that you're, you're fund, you know, to get funding, you, if you're looking to get money in the next 18 to 24 months, you need to be starting now so that you're getting in front of investors at, at the right times. Yeah. COVID might be slowing your growth. But if you have a good story and you know your product and you know that it will come out, um, I think I think that'll help in the long run. Great. Um, we had a question come in from our LinkedIn feed. Um, any advice on finding a co-founder amid quarantine? Um, so any advice on, you know, building your leadership team and finding co-founders when everyone is at home? That's a great question. Um, you know, I think uh i think you have to look at your network um i know we get resumes in all the time for different positions primarily cfo and controllers but there are other people who can add value and you know there's other people in the market who um can add value to a company that necessarily does not have to be a co-founder but can be an ad uh, you know an advocate or something like that that we your network can hopefully help you connect so um, if you're working with, you know, different lawyers and accountants and, and bankers, talk to them. Um, they want to see you succeed. So talk with them about how, hey, how do I get, I'm looking for this. Do you have any ideas of how to do it in your, your area? So I think that, again, going back to your network is the key thing. And I, I think it's, it, the whole virtual meeting has really opened up a lot of doors and people aren't afraid of it anymore or, you know, worried that, you know, you have to have someone across the table from you, in front of you, you can see them and do a lot of stuff that it's more accepting. Definitely. Um, okay, well, so we talked about this earlier, but going back to it, because um, it came in again, is it a good idea to pivot if our product makes sense for that right now? Yeah, I think that, I mean, if it makes sense, and you've done your, your, your research, and your background on it and understand where you're going. Yeah, I think there's nothing to say you can't pivot. A lot of companies, you look at very successful companies, they started as something completely different. They may have had the same name, but they they took an idea, took it as far as they could, and then realized, hey, let's 
let's pivot and go this direction or that direction. So um, I don't think that's a, a bad thing to do if you, but I also want to say that hopefully this, this, this environment doesn't continue. So don't be so hesitant to give up what you've been doing if you haven't done the real research on where you're looking to go in this pivot. Yeah, that's true. I mean, especially just with the news of a potential vaccine, right? Um, I think a lot of people, you know, stocks went crazy over that. A lot of things changed, but, you know, um, we have no idea what will happen in the next few months. That's a good point. Yeah. And the new um, presidential candidate, I mean, it's, we don't know what his plan is yet. Um, mm -hmm. So it, it's going to be an interesting year and an interesting next few months to see where, where it goes. Yeah. Um, speaking of that, I added this one because when we started doing a lot of these AMAs around running a business during, you know, COVID times, it's new for a lot of people. Um, and a really popular topic that we get, speaking in government, is um, we have founders asking, should we look to government aid programs to help us? Yeah. Um, and I think this is, you know, all over the world, right? Different states, different cities, different countries. And so what are your thoughts on the government aid programs and should people take advantage of those? Uh, I definitely think so. I mean, we've assisted a lot of clients with the PPP loans over the over the past what, six or seven months. Um, I think using those programs are are great, as well as there's there's other ways of government aid, whether it's um, you know talking with your accountant about different tax saving measures. What can we do? Is uh, if we get employees in this state, will that give us any advantages or anything like that? There are things beyond just direct programs that you know in this time of crisis where we need to protect cash and find ways to incentive, you know, um, you know, get some benefit. I think there are, I would definitely take advantage of those programs if I could, but also I will say some of those understanding those programs from top to bottom, because some of them um, you may lose your IP and you don't want that. I mean, you may lose rights to your IP. So understanding, the, what the requirements are of that government aid and those government programs is key. Great. Uh, next question. How often should companies discuss their business taxes? Um, I think at least uh, taxes as in government taxes, I guess. Yeah, that's what. Yeah. 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 All right. Um, yeah. I think it, at least two times a year, if not more. Um, this, especially we have a new president that's talking about an, um, tax reform. We don't know what that's going to be exactly. We've seen his plan, but things change over time. So, um, I think talking with them, you know, at year end, um, planning for the next year, what can we do? And then also periodically through the year. I mean, I, I don't think there's any, any reason not to, if you, especially there are situations, um, such as, you know, R&D credits that change and can actually put money depending on the state and the um, and where you are and where you are in your life cycle um, that can put money back in your pocket. And those have filing requirements. And if, sometimes if you miss them, it depends on the state. If you miss them, you miss them. You have to wait till next year. So I think, you know, getting a partner that is aware of the industry, understands the needs of a technology company and um, talking with them you know, two, three times a year to make sure you're on top of all that. Um, I mean, it, it's amazing what a two hour call can do. Um, and a lot of times the, the account, I'll, I'll speak for myself. I would, I'm fine. It's talking with my client and understanding what's going on. I don't charge for that or anything. I, I view it as a, a value add to them and, um, and just understanding how we can, what we can do to help them. Great. All right. Um, Questions are coming in um, and a reminder, go ahead and submit them under the video or in the LinkedIn um, chat. I'm also looking over there. Uh, many, tab many tabs happening right now. Um, all right, this one came in from LinkedIn. When looking at investment history for venture firms, any tips on finding funding for a startup first of its kind? Um, so, you know, how should people look at uh, investment firms past investment when looking for to work with them? Um, let me, let me, uh, let, let me clear, make sure I understand the question. You're the, and please add. So you're looking at the first of its kind company and you're looking at the 
investor sort of history of what they've done in the past? Correct. Yeah. Um, yeah. Hmm. I mean, I think, you know, just understanding how they can help you and what they can do. You want to, I've got a lot of, I've had a lot of companies in the past that have had three to four investment funds throwing money at them. And uh, to be honest, the most successful ones are the ones that didn't take the highest dollar amount. They took the one that was most strategic to them. Um, and, you know, how can they benefit? How do they understand the, the different, um, the, what you're doing and where your business is going? Now, I will say, you know, first of its kind, that's great. And things are constantly changing. But I, I will say, you know, technology, you know, we have health tech, fintech, uh, Internet of Things, SaaS, they're all different sort of branches of the same thing. So I wouldn't, it would surprise me. And, you know, we have AI and I don't mean, I mean to talk about it, but it would surprise me if it's such a new thing that no one has ever seen before. There's usually essence of what your company is compared to other things, even though it, it doesn't fit into a category of, um, you know, a list of category of, of different technologies. Um, we struggled with that on our side, you know, putting together sort of a mission statement for our technology practices. Um, we didn't want to limit ourselves by saying health tech, ed tech, all these different things. We wanted to just, all right, how can we define technology as a whole? Um, Cause a lot of them we have more experience in than others, but they still have essence and, and, you know, operate similar to the core you know, technology industry. Definitely. Thank you. Um, all right. Any advice for communications with my board? Should I keep the board updated more often during this economy? I think so. I think it's just like your investors. A lot of times your investors are sitting on the board. I mean, that your board is your advisors. They're, um, they're there to help you. They want to see you succeed. So I think talking with them, um, and even being proactive, going in there with sort of a SWOT analysis of where, you know, where our strengths are, where our opportunities are, where our weaknesses are, and um, and going from there, you know, you know, you know, really use them and their experience to, you know, make sure you're heading in the right direction. Great. All right. Um, let me see. Next question. What are some of the most important aspects founders should know before choosing a firm to work with? I think it's um, a couple things, their background and, and um, their history with technology companies. Uh, there's a lot that we compete with that are not, you know, they they dabble in the industry. You want someone who is in the industry, uh, you know, 70, 80 percent of the time um, that are as well connected. Because, again, like I said earlier, they're part of your network. So um, I have connected some of my clients with new investors, with new attorneys, with new lawyers where need be. Um, so they're part of your network and making sure they're involved in that network and understand the nuances that change every year. We're, you know, being head of our technology practice, I'm trying to make sure we're staying on top of the different changes that are coming and making sure we're getting in front of companies and reminding them, Hey, this is an opportunity that, um, you guys should, should take a look at, or this is a risk that's coming up, you know, states, you know, what is it? I can't remember how many years ago, the Wayfair case where um, they started sales tax started and use tax started to be charging by more and more states. Previous to that, technology companies were sort of immune to that. No matter what state they went into, there was no sales tax, but now there there's 18 states that charge sales tax now. And yes, that's a tax on your customers, but you're still responsible for administrating that. So, um, your accounting firm and your all your advisors should be on top of what's changing in the industry so that you're aware of those risks out there. Great points. Um, all right. So last call for questions. If we have any coming in, um, I'll check over on LinkedIn before I get to this one. Um, and if you are on Crowdcast, go ahead and submit it in the chat box or below our, um, our video. Uh, how can I stay up to date with any new laws or tax rules and announcements around COVID-19 in the economy? Um, I think this is great because there's so much happening, um, especially with a new you know, administration coming in and new things happening. So what's the best way to kind of stay up to date about how it affects your company? Um, I, 
I, I struggle with that as well because it's changing so rapidly, so fast. Um, I think, number one, watch the news, understand what's going on. Um, uh, two, make sure your advisors are in place, that they're thinking about this stuff, whether it's your board, investors, or your lawyers or accountants or bankers. Um, I can't tell you how many times this past year with the PPP loans and the um, the various programs out there that we went directly to clients saying, this is an opportunity, This you need to do this and, and pushing it. And a lot of them weren't fully aware of what, of what it was at the time, but we were on top of it watching um, all the, uh, the press releases come out, making sure we were ready to go and make sure it's, Again, we looked at it as it's uh, it's helping our clients. You know, we, we help them, you know, make it through this time. And that was our end goal was how can we make sure our clients are taken care of? So aligning yourself with um, good advisors who know the industry and are on the market and staying abreast yourself, just um, watching the news and understanding that. Great. And I'll add a little bit of plug. Um, you know, following people like Techstars and Bennett Thrasher online and Twitter. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we have a lot of awesome partners supporting our founders that are holding events like this for, you know, people around the world. So, um, you know, we try to put out any kind of news and announcements that we see, but, you know, go ahead and follow these different technology partners that are supporting entrepreneurs. Um, and, you know, they'll put out news whenever they do hear it too. Mm -hmm. um, next question. What are some of the best tools that Bennett Thrasher uses in helping founders? Hmm. I mean, trying to think of tools in, in and of itself. So we, we do have um, a client accounting service practice that uses QuickBooks and Intac. So they're cloud-based programs that allow that. And, you know, we were fortunate from the audit side that we had this portal set up that, you know, basically allowed our clients to drop documents and, and whatnot into it virtually. And, you know, we've been using it for years um, in, in order to get stuff electronically sooner and be able to keep the communication going. So it was really seamless using a product like that um, during this time. I mean, when we shut the doors, um, I think March 23rd and said everyone work from home, it, it was um, it, it, having that program already in place was great. And then we've gone to we've expanded our, you know, um, our Microsoft products to Teams. Teams are great. We've set up Teams to talk. We have meetings in Teams. We share documents and files that way. So we're using all sorts of these programs to, to talk internally as well as talk externally and get in front of clients. Um, it's, you know, at first I thought it was going to be tough to, to get in front of clients and prospects and whatnot, but everyone has really embraced the Zooms and WebExes and Crowdcast and whatnot to to really get in there and, and talk with them. So we're using these products. We, I think we're talking daily with our clients um, and, and multiple times a day with our teams. So we're using those sort of products to, to deliver, to deliver value. Great. Uh, this one came in from LinkedIn and I know we kind of discussed it earlier, um, but any advice on how to create contacts in the tech industry? So, you know, if someone is new in the tech industry, how can they go about, you know, creating a network? Yeah, that's a great question. There's a lot of um, organizations in different metropolitan areas that allow for that. I would in encourage joining those. We, in Atlanta, we have uh, Technology Association of Georgia. We have ATDC out of Georgia Tech and um, that are there to help entrepreneurs grow. And, and, and on top of that, we have several um, incubators that sort of help people. They have weekly, monthly meetings to connect people. So um, I think getting involved in your community is the way to do it. You know, there, there's a lot of people out there who are looking for jobs or looking, you know, how, how, how can we grow our product and whatnot and get some information on that. So I think that's the first thing. And then again, lawyers, bankers, attorneys, I mean, those are our accountants. They're, they're a network in, in and of themselves. Great. All right. A um, couple more questions. With a new administration coming in, do you see any uh, regulatory changes that companies should maybe be aware of? Um, I don't know. I mean, I think there there's always a chance for change. I think some of the stuff the regulatory is going to be tax driven. Um, what Biden has said in the past. Um, 
done a little bit of research there, but I mean, what Trump said coming in was not what actually happened. It changed a little bit. So I think just staying on top of that over the next, you know, several months and into the new year are going to be the, the key things to, th to stay on top of. Um, okay. All right. Um, so I don't have any more questions coming in, but I'm going to throw this last one at you because it's kind of, uh, I like it. I like to always end these events with some inspiration and advice, you know, for founders out there. Um, how have founders inspired you at this moment? I mean, I, I wouldn't even just say this moment. This is what keeps me going in this industry. I've been in it for, um, over 10 years now. And it's great. Um, learning about new products, learning about uh, these uh, cool ideas that accountants like myself are, are never going to come up with. We're all, um, I'm amazed by them. And, and also it, it, the, the, the youth that's coming into this environment is very, very um, kind of keeps me young. I mean, I don't view myself as too old, but I'm, when I go into a lot of the companies, I'm one of the older ones now. So it's, it's a lot of fun working with those people and, um, you know, I, every day it's, it's a, it's a exciting, exciting time. Um, and yeah, the new ideas and that's why I keep coming back. They're great. Awesome. Um, well, any final words or, um, advice for the founders listening? Uh, just keep moving forward. Keep, um, talking with your network and expanding and looking for opportunities. I think that's the key. Anything we can do to help I'm I'm glad to help. Awesome. Uh, well, thank you everyone for joining us um, here on Crowdcast and also on LinkedIn. Thank you for tuning in over there to the live stream. Um, we will email, um, if you hear on Crowdcast, the link to Bennett Thrasher so you can learn more about them and how they can help you. Um, and Brian, thank you for your support. Thank you for supporting Techstars. And we'll see you next time on Crowdcast. All right, thank you. Bye.